a good morning and, and uh, thank you for suffering through a second talk of mine. Um, today's a little more, I think, a little more of a fun talk uh, in the sense that it's not so mechanical. As always, you know, I give very laid back talks, so if somebody wants to raise your hand and object or, you know, ask a question while we're going, it's good. That's, it's supposed to be a two-way highway. It's supposed to be an interchange. And as yesterday I gave you my perspective on spine, today I'll give you my perspective on head trauma. I, I, I head trauma because it's a continuum. And just like yesterday, we showed, you know, some people that had very severe injuries. Because to really, pre you want to, just like a cardiac event, just like cardiac ischemia, you want to kind of have your arms around. You want to have a feel for the whole spectrum, you know, from a little angina all the way to a full cardiac arrest. So I like to walk through the whole thing. Because when you look at the patient, it's a lot more fun to take care of people if you can in your mind think about what's going on inside this machine you know just like taking care of like we talked about yesterday just like you know car repair i don't know much about cars my sons do and you know they enjoy looking at the car and hearing the car because they can kind of feel what's going on i don't have the ability to do that with a car but when you take care of a patient you want to be able to imagine what's going on you do better job taking care of them and Doing this for 30 years gets pretty boring and trying if you can't enjoy it while you're doing it. Now, concussion. So what is a concussion? Part of the problem with this is just the definition. You know, what constitutes oh, a little bump in the head and what constitutes an actual concussion? And as we're going to see, that definition has changed. There's even a thing now called subconcussion, which, as I'm going to show you, is actually very important. And what translates into something that's significant for this patient, for your athlete, for the patient over time? Each closed head injury, and we sep in neurosurgery, we separate head injuries into open and closed. Very simple. You know, not something you have to remember. But obviously, if the head, if the skull is violated, that's open, just like open fractures and closed fractures elsewhere in the body. So we separate these into open and closed injuries just is a matter of technique. Each one of these injuries, though, is unique, which is what makes the scientific evaluation of this difficult. Once again, we talked about yesterday, for those of you that weren't here, in the United States, people, the, the, particularly the government, likes to talk about air, airplane crashes and aircraft safety and compare, try to get medicine into that area because, you know, air, air, airline safety is unbelievably different than 20 years ago. It's a desirable goal. It's a very good model in the sense that problems with aircraft lead to horrible problems just like they do in medicine. However, aircraft is a physics event. It's a mathematical event. They put a man on the moon in the late 1960s and they landed 800 feet from where they were supposed to land. The Earth's revolving. The moon's revolving. The moon's going around the Earth. And they did it within 800 feet in 19, I think it was 69. But that's math. They can tell you where the moon's going to be 200 years from now with great exactitude. What makes biology beautiful is biology isn't math. Biology is forever variable. And so every head injury is a <coughs> unique event. The person who flies out the car window and is found 20 meters from the vehicle has a totally different event than the person who heads a soccer ball, which is totally different event from the person who in a boxing injury gets punched. The angle of impact, the rotation of every one of these factors chain, makes it a unique event and they all have to be seen by the examiner, by the coach, by the sports physician, by the surgeon as a unique event. But that's also what makes it very hard to quantify what's the right thing to do, what happens to each person. Because if you take 200 head injuries, Every one of them is subtly different. The amount of the newtons of force, the linear and, ex, and rotational acceleration, this age of the patient, condition of the brain, they're all different things. Remember, one of the key features for the brain is your brain floats inside your skull. Your brain isn't attached to anything. It floats like a buoy in a lake. You make a cup of spinal fluid a day, a full cup. 0.3 ml per minute is produced. It's produced in the ventricles in the center of the brain, 
the spinal fluid percolates down the spinal canal and is reabsorbed at the top of the head. It makes a whole cycle every few minutes, a constant flow of spinal fluid. And the brain floats. Makes sense you would float the brain, doesn't it? Because the brain acts as, a, it, number one, it's got nutrients, it's what provides the physiologic environment, but it's also what pro provides some degree of hydraulic percussion protection for the brain. So it's, a, it's an, as everything in the human body, it's an amazing system. Every time your heart beats, every stroke of your heart, 20% of the blood goes to your brain. I mean, look at the size of your body. Look at the size of a leg. 20% of every stroke volume of your heart goes to your brain. When I started my neurosurgery training, my chairman said, you can determine the importance of your field by how much blood goes to it from every beat of the heart. Enough said, right? <laughs> studies have shown, there's a, a, quite a few studies in the United States now about concussion and subconcussion. And they put accelerometers in football players' heads in the helmet. Exactly what force is the key force that gets you in trouble is not known because each impact is linear, rotational, all of these things are different. But they did one study that was published in 2011 and the average football player on this team took more than 500 hits in excess of 10 G. Some of them much higher, some of them much lower. The University of Rochester where I am and where I train probably has one of the worst football teams in the world, I suppose. I mean, like American football, football. And I don't know why they call it football. I'm not going there, okay? I got no dog. I, they don't use their feet. I don't know why it's football, but I don't know what else to call it. And they had one guy on the team that had t over 1,200 impacts that year, and they had another person on the team that had less than 50. So the amount of impacts per person, obviously, is extremely variable. But that's something that's being studied very aggressively now. Um, the uh, American military, every, every soldier that deploys has an accelerometer in their helmet now. So they're trying to analyze impact force, what's the threshold, what are the outcomes. That's all stuff that the data is not there, but it's being accumulated aggressively. Practice impacts, especially at the University of Rochester study, uh, was found that practice actually generated equal and many more impacts because there's a lot more practice than games. So practice counts in all of this as we walk through this. There was a study in, the in, in a, what's called neurosurgery, one of our two main journals, that suggested that direct impacts on the vertex of the head disseminated kinetic energy into the brain as effectively or more so than any other impact. But I would tell you this, remember the brain floats. Right? It's just bobbing around in this bucket of water in your head. Nature is unbelievable. Do many people here have kids? When, we had, when my kids were little, my kid must have had 2,000 head injuries a month. <laughs> hit the coffee table, falls into the you know, chair. They hit their heads all the time. But remember, when you're born, your skull expands as your brain expands. The skull plates in a child sit right on the brain. And as the, that's why there are those cracks, those sutures in the skull. And as the brain grows, the skull grows. And by age three, your head's 85% of adult size, it's over. The sutures fuse and your skull becomes fixed as the, just over age three. So that's why if you're going to correct deformities of the skull, you have to do it before that because you're waiting for the brain to make the shape. The point is when a little child, first of all, they're not very tall, so the amount of force, right? Torque is force times distance. When a kid falls and hits their head, there's less torque than an adult. Number two, the brain doesn't rotate in, a in an infant head because there's no room to rotate. When you take an 85-year-old person and they fall down the stairs, they've got a size 5 brain and a size 10 head, and the brain swirls. So as the brain swirls, you get more rotational injury. So although impacts to the vertex of the head from an accelerometer standpoint register more impact, it's the rotational forces on a brain that are actually more damaging from a standpoint of dying. When you take, they took primates, you can't do this anymore in the United States, but a guy named Tom Generelli took primates and they would impact them with a plunger. 
And when they impacted them with the plunger to get a rotational force, the whole brain swirls on the brain stem and tears the fibers in the brain stem. So rotational forces, although they are registering lower Gs, I get it, I accept it, actually rotational forces are more likely to cause very permanent severe harm. Not cognitive harm, but severe harm. One other very important point. Remember, the part of the brain that thinks, cake, does that, that's a word, you know, like a cake, like a cake you bake, like a wedding cake. The frosting on the cake is the only thing that thinks. There is nothing inside the brain that thinks. There is no thinking going on after six millimeters of the surface of your brain. It's the frosting on the brain, like a cake. Think of a, a wedding cake. It's the frosting that does talking, feeling, emotion, I love her, I hate her, blah, blah, blah. That's all the outer four to six millimeters. And that's key because as the brain ricochets around in the skull, what's deep in the brain after the outer frosting, after the six millimeters of the surface, it's all wires for motor movement to take this part of the brain and connect it to that part of the brain. I love her, I don't love her, all that stuff's on the outer surface. So when the outer surface is damaged, that's what makes you human. The stuff deep inside, 90% of the brain's doing no thinking. It's electrical wires from one part to the next for different reasons. One of the things that's not known now is, so what is the threshold? You put the accelerometer on a player's head and you measure exactly how many impacts he gets and you measure exactly how many forces of Gs. You know, the forces generated in athletic events are 10 to 12 times what a fighter pilot pulls in a tight turn in a fighter jet. They're tremendous forces. The, 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 the art of medicine is going to come back here every bit as much as it did yesterday. So I'm being maybe very old-fashioned. It's okay. I like it. There's scat, you know, as, as Scott mentioned, there's all these concussive measures, and you sit with the player, and you check off all these things. And those are good because it allows research. It, it gives you consistency, and consistency is good. Methodology is good, and you can't get results. You know, when the Glasgow Coma Score came out for severe head injury, it at least allowed that place to talk to this place and say, how, are, how do we compare? But it doesn't take away the fact that nothing you do, an accelerometer, none of these things equal a skilled coach, a skilled field side person that gains experience with this and feels the, what the player is going through and tries to analyze this in a biologic way, not just a, a statistical, me methodological way. An interesting study that was published in, in Britain in 2005, they had an Olympic boxer box a dummy that had accelerometers all over the dummy's head. And he was generating 72 G with punches to the head. So the forces are tremendous. As I mentioned, the style of play has a lot to do with what you actually suffer by playing this game. I had, a, both my sons played ice hockey. I had one son that was very aggressive and probably hit his head about 20,000 times. And I had another son who was much more genteel and tried to skate fast and generally didn't like getting smashed into the glass. So when somebody says, I played this or I played that, you know better than anybody, you know, how often you head the ball in soccer, football, I mean, football. How often you head the ball is, to some degree, an individual playing variant. In ice hockey, which I only know a little of because of my kids, you know, in ice hockey, some of the best kids on the team got hit very little. They were very skillful at working their way down the ice. Some of the kids were big kids that were enforcers, and they got hit a lot more. And as we're going to see, that can change your whole life. And it's changed what, what is known about concussion, although there's much we don't know, what we know is totally different than what I was taught up till about 10 years ago. Concussion and subconcussion. Incidentally, this work was done by Anthony. The model for concussive research is actually patented to one of my residents. Um, he did a lot of the studies with Julian Bales, who's in that movie Concussion. He worked with our staff and with Julian Bales. And he has the, the rat model patented for his, the way he did it. 
and one of my other residents is Matt Dash now, and they published an article in Neurosurgical Focus, which is our online rapid dissemination way of getting neurosurgery information out. In concussion, of course, there's no macroscopic footprint of the injury, okay? So somebody's playing football and they head the ball. There is an impact, I mean, where do you call that a concussion? If, you're, if it was your brain and you were a little person living in your head, when that thing hits your head, there is an effect. Whether you want to call it a concussion or whatever, call it what you will. But the threshold of what do we call, okay, that was okay, that wasn't okay. As far as your brain's concerned, probably none of it's great, all right? That doesn't mean you should sit in your room and never go outside and never play sports. I'm just saying, let's be honest, right? As far as your brain's concerned, that little frosting that thinks and feels and talks and is emotional, probably getting hit in the head, not at all, would be nice. But unless you just want to be a bowler, which is terrible for your spine, yeah, if you enjoy life, you got to take some risk. So pick your poison. But sub-concussion turns out to be very important. There was no such thing as sub-concussion when I was training until about maybe 15 years ago. What's sub-concussion? And I'm going to show you that sub-concussion might be very important, critically important for athletes. Maybe one of the most important things. Sub-concussion means I got hit in the head, I headed the ball, whatever way you had the impact, CAT scan normal, MRI normal. No macroscopic anything, it's normal, but as we're going to see, that doesn't mean your brain didn't care about it. I'm not making any qualitative comment on what people do. I think smoking's fine. As long as you know, smoking's probably not great for you, okay? I eat rare steak. It's probably not good for me. It's life in the big city, right? Rotation and linear velocities both lead to cellular wall disruption. And that's the key for concussion and sub-concussion that wasn't known. When I was training 15 years ago, we thought you had the ball, you were dazed, you have a retrograde and a post-traumatic amnesia, maybe 10, 15 minutes. You don't remember that play. You don't remember exactly what the score is. We thought when that's over, it's over. You know, if you walked away, be glad, it's all good. You all back to zero, we start again. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. We always thought you got hit in the head. Man up. Relax. You're okay. You're still alive. You're fine. Maybe not. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do these things. You just have, like cigarettes. How many cigarettes is bad? You decide. How many impacts to your brain is okay? You decide. You guys are in a tough position, I think. Because for somebody like me, I can decide how I want to protect my head because it has no impact on my life. You're under unbelievable pressure, I bet. Because, you know, Ronaldo or somebody that's a big player, even somebody who's not a big player, they want to play. They want to play. You want them to play. And if you don't want them to play, there's going to be repercussions on you. But you have to, if you could talk to that brain... The brain would like to have something to say, I bet. As the cell wall, so this is a cellular injury. Concussion and subconcussion are at the cellular level, not the macroscopic level. You can't see it. You can't MRI it. But when the impact hits, when that ball hits the head, at a cellular level, on the surface of the brain, which is what thinks and is what makes you human, the cell walls are disrupted. Not mechanically disrupted, but chemically disrupted. And that's been proven without equivocation. Without equivocation. Just a quick point on the research. My resident, who's now my partner, I, we brought him into our group two years ago when he finished. He's a big American football player. Big stocky guy from New Jersey, loves football. He has a Viking scrub hat, okay? So he's, he loves football, and he didn't mean to find this. They found it by accident. When they took a rat, and they would put the rat on styrofoam, you guys know what, you know, I don't know if it's the same word here, because when you're an athlete and you get hit, although you can fall on the ground and that's like hitting a rock, 
most of these impacts with soccer balls and hockey are, are the heads moving at the same time as the impact. So he put the rat on styrofoam and they would drop a weight on the head to give the rat a concussion. You know, 10 grams, 20 grams, different size weights. Some they'd hit one day, some they'd hit three days in a row, some they'd hit six days in a row. And they would, the rats, the way they test the rats is they put them in a maze and rats will always, they'll look around the maze and then the rat will go against a wall and they just sit against the wall because they want to be able to control, a smart rat doesn't want to have things behind him where he can get in trouble. So a smart rat will go up against the wall and just watch and be careful. After they would hit the rat once with a certain force, those rats would just walk outside the maze. It's called risk behavior. They didn't care. They're not, they're concussed. So they would start doing things that are dangerous. They'd walk around outside the maze. And in a couple days, a day, one day, five days, seven days, depending on the impact, the rat would go back to getting against the wall and he would be better. The rats they hit three to six days in a row, they put back on the shelf and he said all we were going to do is just keep them for six months and then sacrifice and look at the brain. But interestingly, with no more hits, with no more head injuries, they got worse. The ones that got hit day after day, even when nothing more had been done, six months later, they were much less capable. They'd walk all over, they never hid themselves in a corner, and they started doing foolish things. And what was, they said, why, I never hit this rat again, why is he worse? Why did he get worse just sitting on a shelf? Because that was not known. Now it's known, why? How many times do you need to get hit? How much do you need to get hit? I don't know. But you take enough hits, you think it's over, I'm done, I'm not going to play anymore. That game hasn't stopped up here. As far as your brain goes, that game's still going on, even though you're not playing anymore. Which explained why some of the athletes that they studied in the United States, they would play all their games and you'd think, okay, it's finally over. And then 10 years later, they were much worse intellectually. It's because this doesn't stop. It keeps going on. You get a head impact. Impact to the head. How bad an impact? Well, nobody knows. 30G, 60G, 60 linear, 30 rotational. Nobody really knows for sure. But every impact probably has, you know, you do what I do all day, you get paranoid. You know, I get hit with a kitchen cabinet and I'm thinking, whoa, what's going on? You know, it, it, if it's your brain, I try to keep in this thing working as good as I can. I think Scotch was helping maybe, but. So this is the impact on the brain. This is the neuron. Remember, the part of your brain that thinks are called neurons, okay? Those are the brain cells. That's the only thing that's talking, loving, hating, feeling, writing, is the neuron. Most of the brain is made up of astrocytes. The blue cells are the astrocytes. They're scaffolding, okay? They're like two by fours in iron that hold the brain cells. Most of the brain's made up of support cells called astrocytes. The most malignant tumor we have in, nerve, in brain surgery is called an astrocytoma, which is a malignancy of the cells that support the neuron. The neuron, that's what thinks. That's what makes you who you are today. And then there's an axon, which is the electrical cable that goes to the next neuron. And that's how you got up this morning and said, got to get my clothes on. So the brain, the cell thinks, sends its message to millions and millions of other nerves to get your stuff on. Now, you get smacked in the head and the cell membrane opens up and chemicals start to flow into the neuron that shouldn't be there. Glutamate, high calcium levels. The, the mechanism, you remember from biology, the cell's a balloon and the amount of chemicals in and out is very carefully controlled by little doors on the cell surface. So when you head the ball in football, you head the ball, the sum of the cells open up their membrane and chemicals start pouring in that shouldn't pour in, that shouldn't be there. And a chemical called tau, T-A-U, which is one of, the, one of the proteins 
that drifts into the cell that's not supposed to be inside a brain cell. The brain doesn't want that chemical <coughs> because it kills the neuron. So you head that ball, some of the cells get a lot of that bad protein coming into the cell and they die. Some of the cells live. But as the days go by, it set, the astrocytes start to die. The supportive cells around the neurons start to die. But over months, one to six months, depends on the injury to the animal or to the person, the cell is able to repair itself. It's amazing, right? It pumps the bad protein back out of the cell. The cell survives, and it goes back to being okay. In the experiments, rats that got hit pretty hard, I mean, they were out cold. Oh, another thing that was important about this study that he did, actually one of the main things of the patent, most of these concussive studies have been done by putting the rat asleep and hitting it in the head. Are your athletes anesthetized when they play? So the study's not right. I mean, you don't take a soccer player, anesthetize him, and then have him head the ball. So anesthetics have been known for many, many years to be protective to the brain. The, the, the mechanism isn't even known, but a lot of anesthetics actually provide some brain protection for reasons we don't know. That's been known in brain aneurysm surgery for 50 years. So he found out, you know, if you grab a rat, you ever grab a rat in a lab? They try to crawl up their tail, and they try to swipe you at their teeth to cut you. But if you grab the rat, he'll fight for a minute, and then they just go limp, and they just decide the best thing to do is do nothing. So he took the rats and put them in, uh, in the grocery store. They sell these little plastic bags. You can buy grapes and carrots. So he got little plastic bags and put the rat in the little bag, and the rat would fight for a minute and then just sit still. So the rats, that was the first project done where the rat was awake, which is much more realistic compared to what an athlete sustains to begin with. What's interesting is the rats that got hit really hard, some of them were even unconscious, if you will, and just collapse on the mat. If it was one time, most of them did pretty well. Most of them at six months were fine, even with a pretty good smack in the head. Because the cell, the brain cell, the neuron, the thinking cell, it, it can repair itself. But what they found and what's critical to you, taking care of athletes, Minor impacts over and over, they did not do well. Repetitive trauma, even subconcussive trauma. Rat gets hit in the head, not a big hit, walks right away, acts oddly. Two days later, hit him again, acts oddly, gets better. Hit him again, acts oddly. It's six months, those rats did not do well with no other impact. They get worse on their own. And the reason is, after repetitive, mild, what's mild, what's mild? If it's your brain, you decide. <laughs> How many cigarettes is bad, doctor? I don't know. Pack a day, two packs a day, pack a month, I don't know, you decide. If it's repetitive trauma, the problem is this. You start to accumulate an inflammatory reaction in the brain. Outside, if you get impacted with the ball on the quadriceps, right? And you get a big clot in the quadriceps, macrophages calm, platelets calm, the macrophages open up, histamines released. The hist What's the histamine do? cause more macrophages, need more help, more help, more cells. More macrophages come, those macrophages open up, there's more histamine, blood vessels dilate, more macrophages come. It's what's supposed to happen to make the thing get better. Inflam inflammatory response is a good thing. It's designed to help you, but it's not good for your brain. And we don't have macrophages in the brain, we have what are called microglia. And the microglia are the inflammatory cells of the brain. And it turns out that when you have, and this, there's no question about this now. Where you go with this, you can argue. But there's no question this occurs. It's proven over and over and over now. Microglia with repetitive trauma. You had that ball 12 times in two practices over three days. 
you start to get inflammatory response around the brain cells. And the inflammatory response brings in more and more tau, more protein gets dumped into the brain cell and eventually the brain cell dies. If you look at brains with Alzheimer's, the brains, the cells are the same. It's ingestion of toxic proteins into the brain cell which kills the brain cell. The, so the process, as you often see in nature, you know, you think, oh, this only happens with this. Nature's so brilliant, it has the same mechanisms over and over because it's efficient. Nature is very efficient. And so the toxic damage in Alzheimer's mimics this very closely, very closely. So as they tried to decide, so what is it that makes the brain ingest these chemicals? As soon as you head that ball, maybe not even enough to have just a momentary amnesia. Amnestic periods are a very good guideline. To the, Denny Brown showed this in the 50s, 1950s. A British neurologist named Denny Brown, when he looked at concussive injuries, the longer the amnestic period, and it's almost the same on both sides of the injury. If you, when you talk to, when you do the, the field concussive study, if you really pay attention, when somebody gets a good hit in the head, they'll have 15 minutes they don't remember before the impact and about 15 minutes they don't remember after. And that's been found to be the most sensitive guideline to how much injury the surface of the brain took. You know, 15 minutes, I don't remember the last three plays and 15 minutes after, and then they start to become 10 minutes, 7 minutes, 5 minutes, and they mostly come back. You start to get into 30 minutes of amnestic periods, that's a pretty good smack in the head. That's a pretty good concussive injury to the brain. If I had the choice between having one really bad hit or 50 moderate hits, all the data would say, take the one bad hit and walk away. Take the one bad hit and leave, okay? Now, the intracellular response is what's key. It, within five hours, those cells have opened up their membrane and the cells become acidotic. A high acid level starts to accumulate in the cell. And if the acid level gets high enough, the cell dies. How many cells is too many to lose? It's your brain, you decide. How many you want to give away? If you're really smart, like a neurosurgeon, you can give a lot away. But, you know, not everybody's like that. Now, in, you don't have to be smart to be a neurosurgeon. I've been doing this a long time, believe me. It's like every job, you know. The intracellular increase in calcium due to glutamate accumulation appears to be the key. So for those of you that are really into the chemistry of it, once the cell membrane starts to open, glutamate pours in. And when glutamate pours into the cell, it brings in more calcium, which makes the cell acidotic, a high acid level, and the cells just start to die. They just start to die. The neuron may or may not die, and whether it dies or doesn't die depends on how much acid got into the cell and can the cell work quickly enough to save that. The inflammatory response starts to happen from the microglia, microglia Usually after this inflammatory st response starts, you had that ball once. Let's say there's 2,000 neurons that are injured. Some of them will die, some of them will live, some of them get better, some don't. Within four to five days, the cell starts to repair itself such that by seven to 10 days, at least in the laboratory, a lot of the cells are getting better. So for you, the key question is, so when can I play again? The honest answer is nobody knows that answer. You know, about seven to 10 days, most of these cells are starting to heal. But what's the worst thing you could do to that cell? Yeah, why don't you go out and head 20 more balls today? The neuron is thinking, oh, I just got better. What are you doing? You know, so what's the right amount of time? It's certainly a week and you know, how many cigarettes is good to smoke, you know? In multiple events, the microglia, our inflammatory cells in the brain, just start to pick up more and more activity and they start to kill more and more neurons. Now, you're on the side of the field and you have to know this, even though you, you don't want to do 
you know, cranial surgery here, which I totally get. That's a whole different spectrum. You want to know about this because this is the, you know, we've talked about, yeah, you know, he got hit in the head with six balls this week. He might not be that smart 10 years from now. Who cares? He's not going to be playing for us anymore. Okay. Well, right. I mean, in some professional sports in the United States, there is, I think you would agree, a little bit of that flavor because I've seen some of them for this, that, or the other thing. And I'd say, gee, I don't know that you ought to be doing that yet. And you can just feel the anger from the coach, from the player, you know, you're ruining my life, buddy. You're ruining my life. How many cigarettes are good to smoke? Okay. So you want to know about this, though, because this happens. It happens a lot. Do you know, does anybody here know the name Liam Neeson, the actor? His wife was skiing, I think, up by Montreal, up by saint jovi And she was skiing, and she had a minor fall. Hit her head on the ice. No big deal, right? No big deal. Two cigarettes. No problem. She went back to her hotel room. She was fine. About an hour and a half later, she got a bad headache. Bad headache. Now, you might say, most of the time, people that play sports, my own kids would say, you always get a headache after you get hit in the head. Lighten up. But when you mix the headache with vomiting, that's a bad thing. That's a bad sign for us. I've seen it a million times, played 2,000 games, vomit all the time. Good, you do that, okay? In my world, as the pressure in your head goes up, headache, vomit. That's a bad sign, okay? Most of the time, it's okay. But if you've got somebody that got smacked, they were running in the field and they collided head to head, and they start getting a headache an hour later and vomiting, you're a fool if you pay no attention to that, okay? She was a fool, and she did pay no attention to it. That's harsh, okay? But they asked her if she wanted to see somebody because she's a famous person, all right? She said, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And by the time you're vomiting, that's a lot of pressure in your head. And we all know what happened to her. She's dead, okay? Because by the time she was comatose, she, I talked to the neurosurgeon from Montreal Neurologic who saw her when she finally got there four and a half hours later because he was at a meeting that I was at and he said she was actually not even normothermic by the time they got her. She was on her way to room temperature because by then her brainstem had died and they have no helicopter capability there. So they were trying to go through the Montreal traffic and they couldn't get there. Incidentally, a dentist could have saved her. The first hospital she went to had a CAT scanner but no neurosurgeon. When I was in the military, there was a guy who fell off the back of a truck, a construction truck, hit his head on the gravel. About an hour or two later, started to become lethargic and sleepy. When you're watching a head injury, the higher cortical functions of man, okay? What makes you a human is your ability to think and talk. If your guideline to He's okay. They hit each other playing. They smash their heads together, but his pupils are okay, and he moves. That's like the oil light in your car. When the oil light goes off, kiss your engine goodbye. Okay? That's a death light. Okay? Pupils are death lights. Talk to them. The first thing you lose is mentation, confusion, difficult to arouse. So I use the same sentence every time. When I have somebody after brain surgery... In the recovery room, I say, I want you to say, repeat, I went to the store and bought a loaf of bread. I went to the store and bought a loaf of bread. I went to the store and bought a loaf of bread and three oranges. Use whatever sentence you want. But if they can say those sentences when you first examine them for your scat, use the same sentence every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes. They should be, a, the minute they start to not be able to do that sentence, they're getting worse. And that's your first sign. That's when things are not going well, okay? And this is not, we don't take care of this kind of severity. We're, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. If two players smash their head together, that's your problem. That's, they're not going to have a neurosurgeon say, okay, it's time to get them. That's your call. And her call, Liam Neeson's wife, she didn't make it and they didn't make it. So they cat scanned her at the hospital that had no neurosurgeon and said, whoa, she needs a neurosurgeon. But it took four hours to get to Montreal, by which time she was dead. This individual that fell off the back of the truck was on an island out in the Pacific, 
there's no neurosurgeon, but with telemedicine they talk to dentists through drilling the hole in the skull. Because there's blood clot under the skull, so even if he plunges a little, right, which you'd expect a dentist to do, even if he plunges a little, it's just going to go, the drill's just going to go in the blood clot. And the blood clot poops, you know, comes flying out of the skull, and when they said, just leave it. Just wrap it in the dressing, the pressure's off, and then they brought the person back to Tripler in Hawaii and did the rest of it. So in those situations, general surgeons, absolutely. You know, anybody who's a surgeon can handle some of this stuff if you have to, if you have somebody to talk you through it. It's not that complicated. I can do it, believe me. Now, this is actually a baseball player, a young kid playing baseball. The ball's part of the problem in baseball. You know American baseball? The torque you can generate in a bat is unbelievable, right? I mean, the velocity of a baseball bat, because they can use metal bats, you know, uh, are they aluminum? I guess they're aluminum, up to a certain level, and there's so much kinetic energy because of the velocity of how fast an 18-year-old kid can swing a bat, the amount of force in a bat. We see every year a couple baseball bat assaults. I mean, a baseball bat is one weapon, man. So this kid was walking around behind the screen where the catcher is, and another kid was practicing with the bat and took a swing and hit him right in the head. He was dazed, confused, right? A concussion. And about a half hour later, he's sitting on the bench waiting his turn to bat and starts to vomit. Should you pay attention to that? Yeah. If they're vomiting and people make fun of you, tell them to have a smoke, okay? If you get 20 CAT scans and don't find one of these, awesome. That's fine. Negative scans are good. CAT scans are good, okay? But sooner or later, you're going to hit pay dirt and find something you should. This is a subdural hematoma. It's a clot on the surface of the brain under the dura. Subdural. Under the meninges. And as this, this usually comes from torn veins, not arteries. There are veins that drain the brain. One quarter of your blood from every heartbeat goes to your brain, and then it drains through veins, called draining veins. And as he gets hit with the bat, the brain swirls, and as it swirls, it rips a couple of those veins, which then start to drip blood and bleed, bleed, bleed. Look at where his ventricles are. These are the fluid chambers called the ventricles of the brain. They're supposed to be here. They're all pushed over by the clot. And if this clot gets marked, when we, first time I saw this kid, he was decerebrate, comatose. And when you squeeze him, he would extensor. It's called decerebrate posture. That's when your brain stem is starting to say goodbye. This kid actually did very well because it's unlike car accidents, his problem was this. The rest of the brain, not too bad. These people that are in high-speed car accidents, and judging by my brief experience on your roads, I bet there's lots of them. Um, when you put your head into that windshield and break the windshield with your head, that energy is deposited in the whole brain. All that kinetic energy is absorbed throughout the brain, and the whole surface of the brain is bruised and pulped. Those people tend not to do well. These individual impacts from sports tend to do pretty well. This is a cheerleader, a 17-year-old cheerleader in Rochester. Do you guys know what, do they have cheerleading here? Probably not. Yeah, no? No? No. Am I not supposed to talk about cheerleading? It's okay? Okay, okay. Cheerleading, now don't, you can make fun of it, but if I had a video of cheerleading today, it's gymnastics, really. I mean, cheer, they, it's unbelievable what they do in cheerleading now. I mean, these kids go four or five people high called pyramids. So this was actually in practice. And her mother was at the practice. And her mother said, you know, three or four girls get together, then they jump on them, then they jump on them. And she was on the third tier up. So she's, what, 10 feet? I mean, three meters or four meters high to her head, right? And the, the other cheerleaders, when they, when they take the pyramid down, the other cheerleaders are supposed to catch them, but they were out of sequence. So she was at the top and did her fall, and they were going the other way. 
And her mother said it was just like a coconut hitting the ground. She said you could hear a thunk like a coconut. She came to the emergency department, awake, alert, no amnestic periods. So she could just go, she should just go home, right? Give her a pack of cigarettes, send her on her way. Everything's observation in head injury. Everything's observation. Just watch. Don't be in a hurry to get rid of them. It doesn't mean you have to be in a panic mode. Yeah, but I want to go back to the locker room. You, you can't. You got to stay here for two hours. I don't want to stay here for two hours. You have to stay here for two hours. It's a very head injury that gets you in trouble. Trouble is very dynamic. Very dynamic and pretty quick. Just make them stay around. The pediatric emergency department wanted to send her home because pediatricians react too severely to nothing and not at all to severity <laughs> has been my experience. If you're a pediatrician out here, it's good. When I had kids, I was glad there were pediatricians. But it's like being a veterinarian, really. And so they said, well, she looks fine. Let her go. And, and fortunately, the R2 in neurosurgery has more power than the chief of pediatrics. So my resident said, I don't know. What? Now, this is the art of medicine. Why did he have her stay? She looks fine. She's awake. She didn't lose consciousness. She doesn't seem to have a concussion. You know why he had her stay? It wasn't because of a guideline. It wasn't because of a protocol. It's because she just hit her head from a 12-foot height. Brain power. Use your head to help their head. If your kid just got hit in the head with a bat, I would worry about that. If it was a minor injury, I hit, got hit in the head with the kitchen door, probably fine. Use your head. Guy, I don't care about a guideline for this. She's fine. No, she's not. Why not? Because she just fell 12 feet and hit her head. That's why. About four hours later, she started to get a really bad headache. And then she started to vomit. She got her CAT scan. Javier, crank that CAT scanner up, baby. That CAT scanner is a godsend for this. Here's her brain. Do you see that clot right there? She, you can see a little swelling in the scalp. She cracked her skull, and there's an artery called the middle meningeal artery that runs up the inside of the skull right here. That's why your mother, mothers always know. That's why your mother always said, don't hit him in the temple. Don't hit him in the temple. Because the skull's very thin here, very thin. When we train residents to open the skull, we never have them use the drill here first because the bone's so thin, they can plunge the drill. You got to learn someplace, right? So you always have them drill here first. I have a new resident in three weeks. He will start here because the skull's thick. It's pretty hard to bury the drill, okay? So here, you can go through that in and it's done, it's through. Why would nature make your skull thin here and thick here? Because most impacts are in the front of your head. Well, why doesn't nature wise up and make it all thick? Because your head weighs eight pounds. And if your head weighed 10 pounds, the cervical spine has to get bigger. But if this gets bigger, my hips gotta get bigger. I gotta make my legs bigger. And pretty soon you have a mastodon. Birds can fly. Birds have pneumatized bones. The bones in a bird are pneumatized. Why would that be? So they're light. If a bird flies into your window, they don't do well. Everything's a trade-off. Everything's a trade-off. So this is thin because nature figured, I don't think it has to be that thick because nature didn't think about baseball bats and cheerleading. So she fractured her skull. That's what Liam Neeson's wife did. Same injury. And when the skull cracks, it tears that little artery. And then over hours, it pulses. But the blood is trapped between the dura and the skull. It's like wallpaper. So the blood clot has to strip the dura off the skull. The law of Laplace, for those of you that are physics, People, the pressure on the edge of a sphere is directly proportional to the size of the sphere. So by the law of Laplace, as the dura pulls off the skull, you know when you do wallpaper, 
the more you pull, the easier it gets. It's the same here. As the dura starts to pull off the skull, it pulls more and more and more and faster and faster. And that's why they feel good for 30 minutes. They're at the side of the field. I don't feel too bad. Hour and a half later, my head really hurts. And then two hours after that, they're vomiting and comatose. And when we brought the next, this is the first scan. I had a really good resident that night, really good. He saved her life. Soon as she started to vomit, she was still awake. He scanned her, and that was the scan. You don't need an MRI. For trauma, CAT scans, fine. More than fine. Easier to get, quicker to get. Oh, but we don't see all the little axonal injury. That's fine, and it's good to see that, but it doesn't change your treatment. CAT scan's the ticket to go. Warm that puppy up, Javier. This, as that clot started to form, by the time we got her to the OR, about maybe 45 minutes after this scan, she was already decerebrate. And the travel from decerebrate to dead is maybe 30 to 40 minutes. I put some holes in the side of her skull, popped her skull off. That takes 20 minutes to do. Seriously, make an incision right to the skull, power drill, power drill, saw, skull pops off, clot pours out. And she went home three days later, totally normal, except no hair. But, <laughs> but she did great. So that's a, total, that's a totally salvageable injury. Yes, I know the time. This, I've, the only golf injury I've ever operated on. Golf. Who would think? Golf's for wimps, right? Golf, you can't get hurt in golf, you know? So this is a high school kid. I've been, have you ever watched, um, well, you don't have baseball here, I guess, but it must be the same in soccer. I, the only times I've watched high school baseball games, it's amazing how strong an 18-year-old kid can be. I mean, they can be powerful. This is a very nice kid, very nice family, big golfer. He's on the high school golf team. His friend is getting ready to drive, and I hate golf. I would rather watch paint dry than play golf. <laughs> but so be it. So my understanding is you're supposed to watch the ball, okay? So you don't take your eye off the ball as you hit it. This kid decides to walk right in front of him when he drives. So he's right in front of the ball. The kid makes the drive. He's five feet away, and the ball hits him right in the side of the head and caved his whole skull in. That's how much kinetic energy is in a golf ball. Because when they design a golf club, they make the, head, they make the club light for what reason? Club head speed. Because kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. So the more velocity that's in that ball, the kinetic energy skyrockets. Same with a soccer, a football, right? The faster that ball's going, the velocity is what determines the kinetic energy into that player's head. It's the velocity. So this guy took this golf ball in the head six feet from where it was hit. He actually, one small interest, remember, CAT scans are backwards. Right is left, left is right. He came in aphasic. <laughs> Can't talk. But that's on the right side of the head. He's left-handed. Left-handed player. 11% of lefties, your speech area is on the right. So closed head trauma, when, the, when you head that soccer ball, all that kinetic energy, this is MV squared, that two should be up. And the brain's an unbelievable energy sponge. When that, the kinetic energy, you know when you play billiards, do they have billiards here? Yes. Pool? Right, that's, kinet, that's kinetic energy transfer. I hit the cue ball, the cue ball weighs whatever a cue ball weighs, and then the velocity of the cue ball hits the next ball and transfers the energy to the next ball. When you head a soccer ball, you are taking the kinetic energy of that ball and transferring it to your brain. How much is okay? How many cigarettes should you smoke? <laughs> Observation field side is everything. You don't have to freak out. You don't have to panic. But you need to re-examine them. You don't have to get your SCAT 3 paper out every 15 minutes. It's all mentation. I went to the store and bought a loaf of bread and three oranges. I gave the clerk $5 and got $3 change. Thanks a lot. We'll do that again in 15 minutes. My patients, I've been doing this so long, when I walked in on that, an aneurysm I did last week, a brain aneurysm, as soon as I walked in the ICU, she said, I know. I went to the store, bought a loaf of bread. I got it. I said, okay. Just bore them. Make them angry. Who cares? I want to go back to the locker room. You can't yet. You can't. 
you got to do, I went to the store and bought a loaf of bread for three more hours. 90% of clots, 1,172 consecutive head injuries at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minnesota. 1,172. 90% of clots occur within six hours. So if you make it to, yeah, but I have my aunt, she got a clot two days later. No, she didn't. You found it two days later. I had a heart attack over four days. No, you didn't. You had it the first day. They just didn't know about it for four days. If you watch somebody, they CAT scanned everybody at Hennepin, three hours, six hours, 12 hours, 24, 48, 72, every patient, 1172 of them. And within six, within six hours, 90% of clots happen. So if you're okay six hours after your field injury, you're probably gonna be okay. Now, you might have, you'll have a concussion. Last case we're gonna show, this is the kind of the ultimate trauma. This is a police officer. He went to an intersection in Rochester, New York to make some kids go away because the neighbors were complaining. He starts to walk back to his police car. A 15-year-old kid goes up into his house, takes a, a 22 caliber rifle, and shoots him in the back of the head. So the bullet entered here. That's the jacket from the bullet. The bullet went all the way through his brain, hit his forehead inside, and ricocheted back. So this is right brain. Look at the size of that track, that wound track, because when a bullet hits tissue, a lung, a liver, a head, a brain, energy sponge, all that, can, it's what is one impact, what happens when the cue ball hits the eight ball? Transfer of energy. So when that bullet hits his brain, all the kinetic energy of a 32 grain, 22 caliber long gun going at 2,600 feet per second, all that energy dumps itself in the brain as it goes through, and it makes a stretch cavity. So it stretches the tissue. That's called a stretch cavity. And it rips that part of the brain apart. He was comatose, decerebrate, and both pupils were blown. That's almost brain dead. He was at the hospital in two minutes and 38 seconds. How do we know? Because he was about three blocks from Rochester General Hospital. He got shot. The police that were with him said, don't call an ambulance, throw him in the car. They threw him in the car. One of the policemen was an emergency medical technician, kept his jaw thrust forward. So he probably was, he was adequately saturated with oxygen when he got to the hospital. And he clocked in the hospital two minutes and 38 seconds after the radio call, he got shot. We tubed him right away. I took him to the operating room immediately after that CAT scan. This is the bullet entry point in his head. He's a 26-year-old policeman. That's where the bullet went all the way through, hit in the forehead, and ricocheted back. Now, with this kind of trauma, that whole brain's swollen, inflamed, and pulped, so I took the whole skull off. That's the entire right side of his skull, okay? That's 30 minutes, 32 minutes, actually, for him exactly. You put, I just put three or four burr holes. These are all holes I put in. You take a power saw, saw the whole skull off to pop the whole side of the skull, which gives the brain room to expand because that's what kills you is the pressure. This is the bullet hole in the back of the skull, and that's my tech holding the whole right skull. That's the entire right brain. He's laying down, so the surgeon's here. This is the top of the head. That's the nose. The feet are that way. So he's laying facing you. And this is the entire right human brain. Occipital lobe, there's the bullet entry zone. The bullet went all the way through the brain, hit the front, and he's got a subdural where the bullet fragment tore a vein up front. I took the clot off. That's the thinking brain. Four to six millimeters of the frosting on the brain, that's all that makes you human, the outer surface. I put a pressure monitor in his brain to drain spinal fluid. We drained a quart and a half of spinal fluid over two days, and I went to his wedding six months ago. That's 92% death rate with that injury. He's intellectually normal, back on the police force, has a weak left arm, otherwise he's normal, and he works as a police officer in the court system. So once in a while, things work out okay. Incidentally, when you have somebody on the field that takes a really good hit, okay, and again, this is your, this is your problem. This is your bag. You know, you have two guys that smash their heads together and one of them's out cold. Whoa, this is beyond me. We don't do this. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. If you're the field person, you're it. You're it. 
in the first 10 minutes might make a whole lot more difference than before I see them. All you need to keep in mind, hypotension, low blood pressure, and not enough oxygen are the only proven things to make that injury worse. So all you need to do, don't cool them down. That's been shown not to be helpful. So all this nonsense about pouring ice all over them, don't do that. Plus you won't cool them down. It takes a long time and a lot of quick ice lactated ringers to do that. But it doesn't help, so don't do that. That's been argued over and over and over in our literature. If you just give them some nasal prongs with oxygen so they've got adequate oxygenation and keep their blood pressure supported with some fluid if they need it, whatever you need to do, you can pour all the fluid in you want. We can take it off with Lasix and Manitol. In a young, healthy heart, it's not a problem. You keep them oxygenated. Get not, you know, why do you want to start an IV in a head injury? Because when they seize, it gets pretty hard to start the IV. So an IV never hurt anybody. If they're out, put an IV in them. Single head impacts probably generate not much long-term injury. As far as is known, not much. The problem is even repetitive, mild events lead to a chronic inflammatory reaction that can give you chronic traumatic encephalopathy from inflammatory brain death. How long out of play? I don't know. How many cigarettes is okay? Questions? <laughs> Thanks a lot.